Going up to British Columbia this hour to talk to Dana Dernford about the latest on Fukushima, which is uh, invading more and more not only of the North American hemisphere, but of its people. It has pretty well invaded the insect world and wiped it out along the coast in many areas. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Dana, of course, is uh, the man who has actually risked his life to find out the truths about the radioactivity and the danger, and the that's like a big vacuum cleaner. It's just sucking things up. It broke the food chain. When the food chain dies, uh, the links lay around and they die, and that's what's happened up there. I mean, it is really bad. Some of the headlines, uh, the Fukushima ice wall freezing is going well. Uh, it's a little late, guys. It's five years. Uh, it's kind of not going to happen. They don't even know where the fuel is. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. And look at Bob Nichols' work. Uh, your radiation this week, number 51, out uh, from Bob. It's uh, not 51. That's, that's not right. Number 51. I, oh, he must be starting from when he started. That's got to be it. Okay. Anyway, there's a lot going on there. And let's see if Dana's uh, with us now. Yep, there, my friend. There he is. Hi, Jeff. Yep, yeah, right here. All right. Now, when I first came to where I am, there were lots and lots of wonderful wild birds. Lots of them. Pretty birds. I even saw some orioles. There were robins that were finches of all colors. They'd fly through here. A lot of them were migratory and so on. That's okay. Red-winged blackbirds all over the place. I have not seen a red-winged blackbird here for three, four years. I haven't seen any finches here. I certainly haven't seen any orioles here. I see a few cardinals. Well, they're actually jays, but they have a little crest. Not many, and I haven't seen any of those in at least two years, maybe three. There's just, there are no birds left. Now, I want all of you to think about this. Why are there no birds here? Why are there very few birds in British Columbia? Uh, it's really, it's very simple, and most of you already figured it out. Dana, what's going on here? I mean, what happened? Well, the say the, there's... In British Columbia, Canada, there's uh, 160 roughly migratory birds and 150 roughly residential birds. And uh, the migratory birds were dependent upon the shrimp, uh, the krill, Mm -hmm. the squid, the sardines, the anchovies, the herrings, and stuff like that. And that's a good way of looking at it. They'd be on the ocean for most of their life, and they would come ashore sometimes on the coastline. Not necessarily ashore, but along the coastline uh, with the migratory fisheries and uh, that disappeared so they came ashore there was nothing to eat in the tidal zones which is what we documented mm-hmm. and we also documented in the forest there was no insects and that there was no birds in those forests throughout the coastline and that uh, the glacier was missing from the mountains in British Columbia so when you bring that together the birds come ashore normally uh, just hunting food along the coastline they wouldn't normally uh, in mass come ashore like that and so they could, though, and they would be, have 5,600 species in the tidal zone, but then they would have thousands of species along the coastline in, of insects that was missing. They went inshore into uh, the interior, and all the insects and the trout, I guess, and everything else was missing on the inside because 8,000 uh, saltwater mirrors were found in Alaska Lake uh, recently. Uh-huh. That was just one little section. And so they had all everything had starved to death. There was no insects. And uh, what we noticed in Chernobyl was the the trees didn't um, decay. And they didn't decay because the microscopic world was gone because of the radiation. Uh, the microscopic world was affected, excuse me, right. long before. No enzymes, else. no no uh, organisms uh, yeah. on the micro level to, to tear them down, to regenerate the them for nature. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all the funguses and uh, just the whole ecosystem itself now. Like you were saying earlier, all the chains, and you've said many times, once you take out a single link, uh, there's a crash coming. When you take out many, many, many links right away, immediately, which is the the very basis of everything. Yeah, it's wow. Now we're seeing it five years later. And that was a basic, uh, terrible, horrible, frightening predictions that we were making. Yeah. When we went on the expeditions, we had covered 9,000 headlines before we went on the ocean. 
And so we had flushed out all kinds of aspects of nuclear mm-hmm. before it went on the ocean. Mm-hmm. And so this was some of the stuff that we were afraid could have happened. But we still, when I went on the ocean and I, the first 200 miles was the experiment. That's what really got us in second gear. I was still hoping to find an oasis of life along the coastline. And after 260 days, 15, roughly, it's a lot more than that, but say 15,000 miles is what I always say. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's being conservative. Uh, It was still, at that point, you had this little hope you were going to find something, always hanging on to it. I remember you you saying that, and you'd always hoped there would be little niches here and there. Right, but you did. You really hoped it, and it it was it meant more at the end of it. And then one day, uh, Zoe wouldn't get on the boat up in uh, Prince Rupert. We just fueled up, groceryed up, and she wouldn't get on the boat. She would not get on that boat. That's after five months at uh, being at sea, being gone away from home, whatever, coming home, and she just would not get on the boat. And I've never seen her do that. And I said to her, well, I guess it's time to go home. She snapped her head around, looked at me as if she could remember what home was after five months, but she really did. Mm-hmm. And I even shot yeah. a video as I was leaving. I said, okay, well, let's go home, Zoe. And we started, we left, instead of leaving the head where I was going to head, we headed home. Uh, and she rode right in the window for the next 12 hours with her tongue out wow. and all happy wow. and everything else. She actually got it. Sure. There was nothing on the beach for her. She would go to the beach, every mm-hmm. beach, and we mm-hmm. had this little zodiac, and we'd go ashore. There was no insects to bother anybody. There was no animals to be worried about. There was no – it was the surrealest thing imaginable. Every day it was the loneliest anchorages at nighttime. There was no sounds. And every day I went into the estuaries at high tide and drove up in the little zodiac uh, and take a bath. And so you look for spider webs and everything else. This is mm-hmm. why all the birds have starved to death. There was nothing, zero left on the shoreline. And there was left in the, nothing left in the forest for them to pick wow. at. Wow. Uh, and so people, scientists and everybody else can deny this all they want. They can't deny, what, 200,000 pictures that I've taken, all the underwater footage, everything is missing. I dove this coastline and east coast of Canada, a total mm-hmm. of over 14,000 logged hours underwater. That's incredible. Yeah, so that's uh, an amazing history when anybody really thinks about it. Usually about six hours a day on the ocean floor. And, uh, you know, I can make four or 5000 bucks every day when I was doing it. Mm-hmm. It did not put me in a wheelchair. It put me in a hospital bed for uh, almost 15 years And when I had an accident. It was 128 days diving. But I only done all of this. Pic- it wasn't about the money. And I know people are going to find hard that, that hard to believe. But I done it because I loved it. I done it because I just loved the environment. I loved that. Mm-hmm. That rush, that thrill of all the marine life that nobody else would ever experience in that little old... See, the whole coastline of British Columbia is ecosystems. It's a, a rainforest, and everything is unique along the whole coastline. All the bio, biodiversity of just little sections are unique, and all the insects and animals that live in there have never uh-huh. been studied because there's so many micro-temperature uh, uh, areas. See, see that's that's all. hard for people to believe, Dana, that there are yeah. actually subtropical rainforest, little climate zones up there. Yeah. Are there 26,000 islands. Take you 71 years to visit each island, just one, <laughs> one island a day, right? Uh-huh. And so, and a lot of these islands could be 50 miles long, so you couldn't do that in a day. And then uh, they're completely surrounded by uh, beaches made out of shellfish. Uh-huh. And so beautiful sand, sand-looking sand beaches, but it's actually shells and coral. That's all gone, too. Tiny, 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 wow. tiny bits per, wow. per, you know, one one percent to one percent of whatever life we want to talk about on the coastline is all that's left. And my kid now, he was telling me a couple of days ago, uh, all the birds were gone. There was a few spots where he found some birds, um, but he, like he's out. When you, when you say birds, he excuse me, Danny, you're talking about sea birds, pretty much, right? We're right, talking, we're talking about, about also crows and seagulls oh, and everything no, else. But we're no. also yeah talking about over 300 species of birds. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, I, I counted 11 species in 260 days out of all those species. Now, anybody don't know me wow. or know anything about that, uh, on the ocean, you would expect to see a 1,000 um, to 5,000 birds per square mile. Uh, that's being... You might see uh, five patches like that, and they're diving all the time. And I brought two underwater cameras specifically to see what they were feeding on. I never used them once because there was nothing to see. Oh. Uh, the trolls are coming uh, hard on me lately saying that I didn't take samples like I originally said I was going to, and I did. 
And I took, I can't remember how many thousands of bags, uh, doggy bags I took with me to get samples. Mm -hmm. But how can you get samples when it's all gone? How can you get (laughs) samples when there's nothing to sample? And there's nothing there to get. So the story became documenting the coastline. Mm -hmm. And it was the same 100 species. Uh, You would only find 10 or 12 species in any given spot when you should... At any low tide, should count 400 species during that low tide. Come back tomorrow, count another 400. Come back the day after, count another 400 in that same area. But, like, I count 12 at best, and a lot of spots was only two or three. So we've never seen nothing like that in the four it's, million other It's heartbreaking. Species. And uh, there's, yeah. as you say, so often, nature would normally regenerate this, but it can't. It's over. Yeah. It's they do done. it in no time, too. Yeah. Like, you can go plow in a whole ecosystem Come back in a couple of weeks, most of it's filled up because yeah. deeper and both sides of it, the creatures were crawling back in the ocean. We just see that it didn't. And the four million other species didn't bother taking advantage of that coastline. Uh, and j- before I forget about it, I want to talk one second about how the ice in the mountain that took 1,000 to 5,000, 10,000 years to, to manifest, the hard blue ice, that's all gone throughout the coastline. The mountain ranges and all British Columbia's mountain ranges – that that is significant because it'll take a doesn't, thousand. That, does it, doesn't this make the news? Doesn't no. this, isn't this a huge story? No, biggest story imaginable. Yeah, yeah, it's gone. This is what they talk about all day. Yeah, that uh, glaciers are going to melt and, and the sea levels are going to rise and all this other stuff. Uh, no one, and now it happened. No, one it's all, it's gone. They're gone. The glaciers yeah, you are gone. Can't be out there slapping you in the mouth with it the whole time, right? Oh, you killed the you killed the mountain ranges in British Columbia. It's all gone. Yeah, your carbon sequestering crazies. And like carbon, as you know, you can't live without carbon. Plants can't grow without carbon. Uh, like carbon is the most important thing imaginable to well, every we're a human. Carbon-based life planet. form, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so they're grabbing the carbon for quite a while now. I assume they're grabbing it for their uh, underground um, cities and everything else and for space travel maybe or something else like that. Because that's what you need for that environment. If you were going to go into the ground and hide away for 100 years, you would want all kinds of carbon so you can grow all kinds of vegetables and everything else. Hmm. Now, with all that missing, all the ice missing throughout the coastline of British Columbia, mm-hmm. folks, uh, now, Jeff, you already know, of course, but folks are not aware, and I talk to people here all the time about it, and they recognize the mountain, the ice is gone, but they, they, they're really confused by it because they're just... They don't look at the world. They just watch uh, what they just listen to what they're told by media, and every media tells you so the same sad. Sto- it's it very is very discouraging. Yeah, looks like they're on they're on the on the ropes now. They're scared. They understand what's going on. You know, when I got arrested, when I came in off the expeditions, and I was about to produce the documentary, I got arrested and all that other stuff. And I right. mean, right. your 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 listeners and yourself have helped that cause dramatically and tremendously and changed that toy and, and gave me back my dignity and gave me a way forward by helping me. But, I mean, they came down on me because they were in fear that people were going to listen to someone like me where I, I wasn't affiliated. Yep. I couldn't be controlled. That's the one weird thing about me is I know that deep inside of me, no matter what they say or what they offer me or what they would want to threaten me with, they can't do it with me, they can't change me, they can't get Mm me to lie, or even, you know, uh, back off a little bit. I just, I just, it don't work that way in my world. I'd rather die on my feet any day, of course, than on my knees or be a slave or or look back and say that I acquiesce to these cowards, to these traitors, to these mass murderers. And so someone like myself and like yourself who just will not give an inch no matter what, we ultimately will win, you know, these little battles because they don't have the courage to come up and slap you in the face, say, for instance. But they, they have the courage to sign a piece of paper that could destroy your life, and no, you would never know they signed that piece of paper. That's but the that's ultimate the cowardice, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they don't have sure. the courage uh, yeah. to challenge me into a debate. No scientist out there. No way. No. no. They won't say, well, Danny, you were flawed on this and you were flawed on that. And I will admit my flaws any day of the week. Oh, yeah. I have no problem with it. I got lots of flaws. And, but uh, the picture doesn't lie. In 2,000 pictures of each <laughs> spot along the entire coastline each day, that I thought would win anybody over. But, you know, they, they won't recognize that. They, it's like, and I mean, the trolls are out there right now every single day on the Internet with videos and with comments saying, I did not do the coastline of British Columbia. Wow. That 
that I didn't do any of that. Wow. So, you know, so what did I do? Did I Photoshop 2,000 pictures a day? Is the other alternative that they're employing by that? Ah, oh, sickening. That's, yeah, that's and sickening. it's sickening because they must have friends and families and loved ones. You'd think. Uh, you'd you think. know, that, that they're worried about. Uh, but they don't see the world the same way as me or you, Jeff, right? They don't covet no. life like me or you. They don't seem to have... Like, we talked earlier today for a little tiny bit on the phone where we talked about uh, satanic and Satanism, devil worshipping. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These people are not... How can we allow this to continue? Well, we, we don't. We, we're controlled by a handful of corporations that are controlling our news and our media and and the way we... Totally controlling it. They own it. Absolutely. Right. So AP or Reuters will come out with a story, and then all the media, Fox and 1,500 aggregates on the planet, will aggregate the story with Fox. And so... CNN and BBC and everybody, they won't even uh-huh. know the story, read the story and physically put it up there. They got a bot that shoves AP right out there. So yep. all of a sudden, right around, the, as you know, and right around the entire planet at the one time then, everybody gets the same picture, the same author, and the same couple of paragraphs from the same media, but from 1,500 medias that aggregated it instantly. It's so amazing how to, they propagate. Uh, just You're right. It's instant propagation, right. instant exposure, the control of the, the mass of humanity is such a science now. It's not a joke. They really run the planet. And just that is the They totally of run the planet. Uh, and it's if you go back to the 1950s, just go read Operation Northwoods. I keep saying this, but understand that in the 1950s, the control was extraordinary back then. Then you can move forward and, and you get things like, okay, Fukushima 311, right? Remember? 0311. What was 911? Another 11. 911. I got a story up. George Herbert Walker Bush made his first live speech about the New World Order also on an 11. And it was, uh, I have to find that. Let me see if I can find it. But this, this 11, 11, 11 keeps coming up. It's a, These people are, nothing's left to chance. It's all being done by design. It's just a total conspiratorial control. And they've got it. They've been working on it for hundreds of years. I mean, and, why? Go ahead. And 11 was um, Illuminati uh, for their wife, wasn't it? The, the number 11? I forget, Is, but it's got a real connotation. But they don't. They're these aren't, wives. Yeah, who are the wives of the Illuminati's that allowed her husbands to create this misery? And it's kind of like looking at Hillary Clinton, you know, how can a woman, mm-hmm. uh, wherever, I have a saying about Hillary for years, I've always used it, is uh, wherever Hillary goes, Blackwater is sure to slaughter. Uh, no. I've seen a demonic look on her face, you know, when she got off the plane in Haiti after oh. the Haiti earthquake. Yeah. And Fukushima was a thousand times Haiti, but... When she got off the plane, you can just see this look of smug look on her face, this look of like, it was a look of satisfaction. That's exactly right. Yeah. Like when a woman stomps you down into the ground or something like that because you were naughty and you deserved it and she she gets you and stomps you down and she has this look of satisfaction on her face kind of look. But this was that that kind of look like she actually done something, like she was proud of what she was looking at. Like, mm-hmm. like she, and that always haunted me. And uh, this you know, that might sound strange to some people that I, 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 I can read that into somebody or something like that, but we all do that all the time. That's sort oh, of yeah. one of our greatest gifts, how we read another person and right. how we interpret Most their Most people don't read. They just they look and they walk and they react. They don't, they're not, they've taken yeah. the proactive nature away from humanity and, and very carefully. There are exceptions, of course, but you're right. It's, it is exactly what it is. Um, you can walk past people in the old days and you just barely lift your hand. They barely lift your hand. There's an old saying where I come from. It's like the shortest conversation in the world when you pass each other. It was in considered extremely impolite not to say hello to somebody or hi. And so you walk past somebody in a typical com. And this is a real thing. This would happen to me all the time where you walk. Uh, how's it going? Pretty good. Yes, boy. Yes, boy. And then you are past each other. That was the whole conversation. But you do that That's all right. day with men, women, and everything else. Yeah, most people don't even make eye contact anymore. By the way, they'll do it. No. They'll do it furtively when you're not looking. They'll look at you, but when you walk by, people won't look you in the eye. No, they don't. No, 
No, I remember, I, like, I come out of a little community, still got no automobiles. And I went up to Toronto where there's a couple of million people. Uh-huh. And um, I was 18 years old. And this was like a huge, just a couple of weeks uh, to go up and visit some friends who had moved away. And it was a huge experience for me. And I that first day, I probably said hello to 500 people. <laughs> I mean, I said hello to everybody. That's nice. And, yeah, I was surprised uh, how many people said hello back to me and how many oh. <laughs> But at the end You're of the day... You're lucky you weren't arrested, realized, Dana. Uh. It was innocence, right? I know. And I never got rid of that. And that was one thing about me that I guess drew people to me a lot of the times in my life I noticed was that I always had that little tiny village charm and that I never got rid of it. And I was always... And I knew every bus driver in that couple of week period. Every one of them, I know them by. I asked them their name, and I sat and had a chat with them. <laughs> to ask them how to get off the bus, where to get off, where do I go from here? And I was terrified. Huh. Uh, but I learned something about human nature was that everybody told me stop doing it, and but I kept doing that, and it was okay. It always worked out for me. I said hello to I said hello to everybody, and, and it was surprising how many people would smile at me. But that doesn't happen anymore. Like you were saying earlier, you can't say hi to anybody because no. they can't hear you. you. Got the earphones in their ears well, they, and their heads. Either that, or they'll report you as a suspicious yeah. character, and that's well, they'll, they'll they won't even answer you now. Even if you got no headphones, they they won't look. They'll look away as soon as you say something to them. You've noticed it's, too. Wow. Yeah, and you used to. Well, I grew up like you say with no TV. Uh, we had uh, very little TV there now, certainly, but we had no TV, and you talked to forty or fifty people every day. That was just the way life was. Because there was no internet, you had to ask everybody. Now people are just, they go to uh, United Nations and whoever and get their data. It's not real data, it's corporate data. They go yeah. for break. Hold on a second, we'll come right back with Dana Durnford in just a couple minutes. Click on Dana's name, go to his marvelous website, and we'll be back with more. Yeah, the 11 keeps, it's, it's weird. Uh, George Bush's first New World Order speech, September 11th, 1991. Ten years later, September 11th, 2001, New York. Ten years after that, March 3rd, 2011, Fukushima. So, 1991, 2001, 2011, 11, 11, 11. This is no no coincidences here. Anyway, go ahead. I just found that to be interesting. Yeah, I do too. Um, September 11, 2001, for instance, uh, people don't look at Building 6. Building 6 oh. was the financial building, and uh, all yeah. the guts were missing. This was a um, half a million square foot building. I ran a, a huge picture of that, an aerial picture, gutted. Yeah, got just blown out from the inside out. The walls and are I, spewed out. I got outwards. a video with yeah. uh, interior pictures. Ah, it's got a million views right now, and uh, it's the only one on the internet of it. Uh, it's two interior pictures was taken by a femur worker. I think that uh, send, them, send them to America. me, uh, Dana, or send them to James. I'll put them. I'll put a link to them. I, this is very important. Yeah, that building, um, and I broke down the building because when you when you and it's very high quality picture. And so I made two. I made a video out of it, and what it showed was that everything got sucked out of each of the offices. There was no furniture in the office. The uh, steel is twisted and 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 bent and melted, uh, and out of there was no nothing fell in the building. There was stuff fell outside the building, and I showed that in the pictures too. But right. uh, what was interesting was everything got sucked out of the building, and so how could you suck all the toilets and cupboards and doors? And 
you know, drip rock and everything else out of the building. How, how is that possible? How can you have a big vacant hole in a half a million square foot building? And it wasn't crushed, right? You can see the basement. You can see cars in the basement where the basement gave, gave its way. So it's a really, it's a really phenomenon uh, that shows there's much more going on. than we. But so 311, we had the terrorist attacks uh, allegedly in London. Now they were they were having simultaneously uh, the same drills at the same stations at the same time mm-hmm. as the event happened, and then they went live with it. They were holding a drill at the same time, and then three eleven, uh, and we all agree there's something really weird about that one, and we've heard all kinds of interesting uh, versions yeah. of what yeah. happened that day. Right, and like I don't rule it nodding, of course, but the fact is we have uh, three melted reactors, and then number three. Uh, was the mixed oxide fuel. Now, the media come out and said that was 2 million times worse than any other reactor on the planet. And reactor three, uh, so what they done was they, they blended in uh, reclaimed plutonium, reclaimed uranium from missiles that have gone through the chain reaction 50 years ago, uh-huh. old nuclear missile folks. And But what happened was the stuff is so volatile. Now, when you blend it throughout the 5 million pounds in each reactor... Unit 3 in particular we're talking about, each reactor had 5 million pounds, but Unit 3 was supposed to be the one with MOX. So it was 6% plutonium. You hear that story all the time, and, and that's true. Around 6% plutonium reclaimed from missiles. Now, when it went through a chain reaction, it was 2 million times worse than what it was originally. And then when you put it through a chain reaction the next time, mm-hmm. it's 2 million times again. And so this is why Unit 3, like if Unit 3 had been the only one melting down, we still would have killed the Pacific, in my opinion, because it was like 2 million reactors. That's very up. interesting. That's very interesting. It, it, well, it was 2 million times worse in terms right. of the output of toxicity. Wow. Well, um, yeah, and so each particle was extraordinary. Instead of being able to pump out energy, say, a foot, uh-huh. they can pump it out 10 feet. I got gotcha. you. Uh, right, so much more. And Now, what they've yeah. done was, it wasn't just plutonium, 6% of plutonium. It was... We don't know how much, but they reclaimed. They used uranium-235 reclaimed from the missiles. And so a lot of people are confused of how that worked. So it's like this. If you have a, if you have a uh, large uh, one liter of water, so that's good for you. You go ahead and drink the water. Mm-hmm. Now, if you take that water and you add in, um, say, uh, a couple of shots of whiskey, Okay, well, now that water has a different property. If you drink it all, you might get a little glow going. But if a kid was to drink it, they could get, you know, pretty sick and pretty intoxicated. Now, if you added in, say, a bottle of whiskey or half a bottle of whiskey and the other half of just water in that one liter, okay, now it's much more, much more dangerous stuff to, you changed it completely. But what about if you only added in a few tumblers of uh, double distilled moonshine, say, for instance, well, you get the same effect as a, you know, as a huge bottle of liquor. Mm-hmm. And so that's what the plutonium uranium is when they mix it in. Uh, so each rod is, there's 280,000 rods. Each rod is uh, 18 pounds and 12 feet long. How, how many pellets. rods? There's 280,000, 82,000 rods in each reactor every 18 months. And so the total inventory for Fukushima for 20 years for six reactors um, would have been around 300 million um, pounds because it goes for 5 million pounds every cycle. Mm -hmm. That goes up on the roof for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And every two years, you put another 5 million pounds or you shift to somewhere else. When he says up on the roof, he means in the storage container. Right, they have uh, an incredibly stupidly built five stories off the ground or whatever. Just unbelievable. That's insanity. Yeah, totally. Why would he do that? They must have done that because they wanted that accident. They done that because I don't know. They, we got twenty seven reactors like that here. That's the Mark One BWR. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so Unit Three was full of reclaimed plutonium and reclaimed uranium. This was two million times worse. And so each element, and so a gram coming at it is you know you're talking about five million pounds in the reactor. Not to mention what was on the roof, but a gram of it is enough atoms to give everybody on the planet cancer and every animal on the planet cancer <laughs> a gram because that's 88 curries times Unbelievable. Uh, 37 billion. So 88 times 37 billion. Uh, each atom can give someone a cancer, but it might take 5 or 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years right. to manifest, diagnose, and everything else. But then again, there's uh, – and I found that story. I'll have to get it. I'm going to bring it up tomorrow on an importer. But there's 1,700 and – change of diseases associated with radiation illnesses 
And I always say 1,800 because it's close to 1,800. But I found out last night, I was looking for it everywhere, and I finally found that whole stuff. I actually got that off your site, I think it was last year or the year before. And because, like, you know yourself and what you go through, you can't keep track of it. No, it's crazy. You're running, you're running with it this year, and that's the, you know, I couldn't, I can't keep track with everything I've done. I have. Boy, do you have the math, though, my friend? Wow. Yeah. Nobody, nobody can touch you with your knowledge. Nobody. Not now, no. Now yeah. I, I've so focused. Uh, well, you know that time on the ocean, 260 days? Yeah. That's yeah. the entire time I was wow. listening to lectures, the entire time I was reading two articles, the Man, entire time, just, every spare moment. You stocked your hard drive so well. Wow. I was so, yeah. Um, and I like I had probably 100 movies with me just to... to Ah. I figured that would come in handy. I I barely watched any movie, and when I did, I fell asleep right away. I couldn't watch it. But wow. lectures, I would just wow. get totally enthralled and mm-hmm. replay little bits and try to understand it and read up on the literature. In my spare time, when I was stuck in storms and everything else, that was my saving grace, you know. I was able to focus. And so when I came ashore, uh, I ended up getting arrested. That slowed me down. Now I'm back up and running. Uh, three weeks of live streaming under my belt, and I'm finally you know, getting my groove where I'm actually staying to a schedule. I didn't know if I would survive through that stuff because it's, you want to do something and you don't know what to do. Uh, it becomes very frustrating. And so like you have a platform, you can bring in all kinds of uh, guests and artists and everybody else and, and really flush out a subject so well and continue to expand on it. And, you know, so I, I kind of, I try to do the same thing or anybody else would try to do, do the same thing. And you have to focus like you're doing and you've got a crew to do it or yourself and whoever's helping you. But when, when a person's by themselves, they kind of feel overwhelmed, but they shouldn't. I mean, you never got to where you're doing because everything was given to you. You got to where you're too because you worked and As committed yourself for Discipline, yep. incredible discipline, work, it is. ethic, yep. like you have. Same thing. I mean, it is, it's true. Well, you've been at it a lot longer than I am, so you, you're much more astute. And you're extremely uh, articulating. And you have such a wide knowledge. And yet you focused your whole front page on the very top of it every day is Fukushima. Because, like, no one has to explain it to you. You got it right away. And the urgency was not to be uh, put off. You weren't going to be dispelled by the nonsense from the industry. You you understood you had something that's really important and you weren't going to be put off. And now look at it. Five years later, you're a major source for it. And look how many people you've actually uh, brought on board and woke up and, and, and consulted. Well, see, the, the thing is, Dana, and you know, we've talked about this and you listening know, the radiation that's coming over here in plumes, it's coming over in the air in plumes, coming over in the water in plumes, different depths, different heights in the air, and it's all being measured. The government knows exactly what's going on. They will never tell us, but they know exactly what's going on. They've shut down the majority of the 99 of their 150 approximately radiation stations have been shut down by the EPA. Shut down. Gone. They're out of business. Nothing to do, right? Uh Uh-uh. The cover-up. Now, the radiation has come on shore. It has caused such die-offs, such a massive catastrophic death up and down the coast, that what you heard earlier in this hour, there are no insects left to speak of. I just got an email from somebody who lives in Florida, I think the Miami area. He said, there are hardly any birds here either. The insects go away, the birds go away. They starve to death. There's no food. Link in the food chain, you can't break links in the food chain. Once that chain is broken, it's broken. And these birds are dead and gone. I'm really sorry to hear that they're gone in in the Miami area, if that's where it is. It was from Florida. But I know for a fact that up where I am and where Dana is, there are hardly any birds left. And there are virtually zero insects. I mean, here it is spring. And on the windscreen of the car, hardly any splats. Very few. Some years ago, you used to go to the store and come back and your windshield had 40, 50 splats on it. No more. No more. Gone. Yeah, and that was throughout. Um, North America, and I have at least 50 people contacted me and told me that through North America, but I experienced it myself. Oh, you're getting that. So it's it's all over. It is all over. See, people don't understand that, folks, there's nowhere to hide, okay? Nowhere to hide from this. Doesn't matter where you live. It's going to visit you, and it is visiting you, and it's in your environment. It's in your ecosystem. It's in your biosphere. It's in your body right now. Right, and we we got to fight back. we got to get on the ball. We, we are running out of time. This is not a game anymore. 
This is proven. And if you're going to wait for the media to tell you, then you're on the Titanic and you're going down with oh, it, whether no. you want to or not. <laughs> yeah. And, you you know, I went along the coastline yesterday. I don't know what's going on with me. Last couple of weeks, I finally got, you know, my health back, so to speak. I went through the really sick, lost a number of teeth, and I got really sick, and I couldn't get out of bed, and it was just madness. I thought I was going to die for sure. And but in the last two weeks, I have the uh, I'm a man on f- on fire, a man possessed, or a man on a mission. I don't. Know. I hear the clarity is back in your mind, like yeah, I heard. I am like, so. Is, I'm like yeah. Well, everybody helped me out, and uh, Dad was able to allow me to buy and take care of myself, buy the stuff I needed, and take care of myself on top of that, and not have Great. that headache. And but I, I I've been like that for so long. I'm so privileged in every sense of the word. I can't imagine how anybody else would have dealt with Well, that was radiation. Yeah. And I had a I dose think- of it about, oh, uh, about a month ago for, a, honest to God, about two weeks. I had the same kind of feeling I did very close to it after Fukushima blew, after the, the radiation began to come over here. I was sick. I think it was probably iodine, uh, 131, whatever. But I was sick for two weeks. Oh, I was walking and working, but I felt awful. And I felt the same way about a month ago for about a week. Just malaise, lousy, uh, sinuses bothering me. And I never have sinus troubles. It's the same thing. Anyway, I won't go into it. But that stuff, it, it comes in plumes and cells, and it can land on anybody's head. Well, we're getting 1,500 buckyballs per cubic meter of air. Wow. In March and April of 2011 in North America. Mm-hmm. And so 1,500 buckyballs, these are from spraying the salt water in the reactors. They're ingesting the radioactive uh, elements into it, and they're like little nuclear engines. These oh, are no. extraordinarily hot particles, and yeah. they last forever. They're not salutable in water. They're easily transportable. They don't need a jet stream. And that alone was uh, thousands of nuclear bombs released into the environment from yeah. spraying the salt water on the reactor. Yeah, that guy, the guy who decided to do that was originally uh, hailed as a hero. Originally, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no more. <laughs> and they stopped doing that. Khan uh, was the president or the prime minister of Japan at the time. Right. Found out that about the sulfur peroxide hydrogen bucket. He ball found out phenomenon. about it. Yeah, yeah, and so he stopped. He ordered to stop it at. But see, that was a cover. They were just desperate mode at this stage. The fuel pools, if they don't get water um, after 11 hours, they lose an inch an hour. So after 11 hours, the fuel rods are almost completely exposed. And just another few hours, they will be. And they, they once they start, because they went through a chain reaction, originally the fuel rods, you can pick them up. When you put them through a chain reaction, a pound of it, will kill everybody, 1,500 people in, in a theater in 20 minutes. They'll do that every 20 minutes till the end of time. And so you can't pick it up no more once it gets to that stage. Wow. So a lot of people get confused where they, they, they say, well, Dana, you know, I've seen workers picking it up and doing this and doing that. I said, well, not after the chain reaction. No. Yeah. Right. And this, uh, this fuel, when it detonated, uh, okay, so a force fire, the bigger the force fire, the higher the particles are injected, and the further we find. So if you have a forest fire uh, within 30 miles of you for mm-hmm. a couple of days, mm-hmm. one of those days, everything in your neighborhood is going to be covered in soot or, or just smoke ash and everything else. You, you can't may not see it. it, but it's there. Sure. Right. And you and you, you, you visually will see it uh, after a few days because it'll show up for 50-mile stretches, say, for instance, just a forest fire. Uh, but that's not as nowhere near as hot as those detonations or those reactor fires were hitting 9,000-degree Fahrenheit temperatures. And so they were able to inject oh, very high up. spewing so much. Yeah. Right. And so if you had a single plume, what I'm trying to get to was that if you had a single plume and that went up into the atmosphere – um, it would take 10 years to rain out. Uh, but when you have a plume all day, every day, like a perpetual motion machine, these reactors are breeder reactors now. They're producing more than what we put in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's why we see the mass extinction playing out the way it is because it's able to ionize and radiate everything that comes in contact with it. And it's able to atomize and aerosol it with these enormous heats, and it did. And so Chernobyl lasted 10 days, but Chernobyl was equal to 40 Hiroshima bombs every day. Right, uh, 400 Hiroshima bombs in a in, uh, 10-day period. Then the chain reaction allegedly stopped on its own. But we think it's the 600 helicopter pilots that who gave died. their lives. Yeah, yeah, that dropped the boric acid and lead on top of it. And some of them fell right in on top of that reactor that stopped that chain reaction. 
And so, like, there, when the chain reaction stopped, they were able to put a sarcophagus over. It's not really an airtight sarcophagus. No, they're building they another been, one now, too. The right. first one and, rotted away. But they're only able to do that because the chain reaction stopped. Mm-hmm. And, they, and that's why they haven't done that in Japan because the chain reaction didn't stop. They can't do and it. They, right. They put a, a uh, Kevlar sarcophagus around it, uh, a couple of the buildings, and then they vented that up the chimney. And 700 <laughs> foot stacks they that's got That's incredible. There. Right, yeah. and so you now, so if I that now you got a, like a smoke room where you're smoking fish. So a smoke room <laughs> where you're smoking fish is you close the door and you fill the room up with smoke, and now forever that room will smell like smoked fish and everything else, because it's permeated throughout everything in inside the room because the doors were closed. But what about if the doors are closed for years and the smoke never stops, say, for instance, but it's still getting out? Well, everything in those buildings, of course, is highly, unimaginably now radiated because they did put a sarcophagus around it. And that it's like a screwdriver where you take it and you put it up on your car battery and you magnetize it. That's exactly what radiation does to material when it lands on it. So when it hit North America and it landed on everything, everything become radiated to man-made stuff. And it's such a confusing subject, isn't it? I mean, I can go on for hours and hours. Well, don't, and hours. Yeah, and, and just remember that low-level exposure is, is just about as dangerous as high-level exposure. There's no such thing That's as safe. Proven, yeah, yeah, That's yeah. yeah. And what are the Japanese doing on top of this, folks? And many of you may not know if you haven't been listening. They have been burning, burning in their municipal incinerators. Every city has a, a one or two or three or more municipal incinerators. That's how they burn their trash. Well, they've been burning radioactive waste. And I mean just junk, garbage, whatever that got radiated from this disaster. They've been burning that in their incinerators for five years. That's around the clock expulsion into the atmosphere of radiation. Plumes, more particles. This is, and no one has said anything. How many stories have you ever seen where someone has gone to the United Nations and demanded the Japanese stop burning radioactive material and throwing the debris, and it is debris, deadly debris, up into the air? How many of you said zero? No yeah. one has said anything. And they've been, where does it go? It comes right over here. In three days. Yeah. The jet, the jet streams are real, even though scientists now say it's not real. But the, we know the jet streams are real. <laughs> and uh, not only that, uh, the incinerators are doing that throughout the entire country, even areas that were allegedly not infected by radiation, I used that word, uh, are, now, are now infected by radiation. Because they're burning it in the incinerators. I mean, 300,000 becquels a kilograms what they're allowed to burn, and they do. And that, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi uh, Military Industrial Complex's nuclear power plant mm-hmm. actually has an incinerator there now that's been going steady for about a year. Mm-hmm. They're burning stuff right from the reactor. They're taking stuff from all over the site and just burning it whenever the winds are blowing. That's another out story I remember yeah, seeing once or twice. Nobody talks about that either. Right. And not only that, um, wow, no, oh. you know, they're burning that. But also, if you look at the sewage system right across the country, they're stacking up all the sewage when they normally would um, recycle it and use it for fertilizer. They can't yeah. anymore because oh. people's sewage is so radioactive right throughout it. And I know Osaka, which is like 500 kilometers up the coastline, so and. Uh, they, they're, they're storing it way up there, and they claim there was nothing landed there, but now we see the numbers of everything. Uh, and, I mean, just is miles and miles and, got, and miles yeah. of sewage. Yeah. They got those uh, plastic bags full of uh, radioactive dirt, radioactive 30 garbage. million. 30, 30, million, 30, 30 million bags. 30 million. Yeah, Black bag, ten, and the bags are going they're breaking down. They can't. They only meant the last year or two at best. Not even that, really. And... Well, the fuel uh, this uh, water tanks should have a life expectancy of five years at the most, and that, they're past right. that. They they dumped all that's all gone because it was releasing neutrons oh, I know. and they're, X-rays. They're you couldn't get close to it. They're empty. Yeah, and so they were em- they were going to empty it themselves because you know yourself you covered it before. They duct taped and plastic and everything else to yeah. the this pipes, and there's no way you can't get in there and fix anything because there's so much radiation. People that had got caught in there got their legs burnt. From radiation, uh-huh. just getting radiation on their legs, and it's just a. But the tanks are putting out X-rays and neutrons. See, that's the problem with the MOX fuel, the, and we've never seen that before. That was only well, it's turned the tanks into emit- The tanks are all emitters now. Yeah, and not only that, that the sludge at the bottom of the tanks can go into a chain reaction on itself, 
And so it can burn a hole in the bottom of the tank and most likely already has. This is what we've seen happen at Hanford, too. Right. Yeah. So the sludge at the bottom of it, of the heavy metals, the elements from the chain reaction, combine with each other and start these little mini chain reactions. And they're able to just, like a torch, cut a hole right through a big tank like that into the bottom of it and all runs out. Now, that ice wall that they're doing down there, what that does, and scientists have already told them not to do it because it reflects the neutrons and the x-rays back, and you can start a chain reaction that way, see? Right there at the ice wall. It's, it's all just, it's so bad. It's so bad. There's nothing positive about it. Nothing. It's all negative, and it's never going to quit. Remember what they said. We don't have the technology to fix the problem. It does not exist on the planet. So there we are. All right. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Congratulations. I'm really glad you're feeling uh, better. You always are effective, but I I hear your mind is is razor sharp again. It is. It feels that way. Hugs for everybody. You and your loved ones too, Jeff. Thanks, Dana. Bye-bye. Dana Dernford and thenuclearproctologist.org. Or you can click on Dana's name and go right there. Okay, that's our program tonight. Glad you were here. It was quite a three hours. We'll be back tomorrow night and serve you up some more. Knowledge, data, facts, and reality. Things to think about. Talk to you tomorrow.